And next, what we'll get into is the trillions of dollars waiting on the sideline, ready to get involved in this space. But there's a few things that have to happen first. So in the next panel, we'll have a debate about institutional adoption in crypto. What is required to bring in that next trillion dollars? And how will it happen? Speaking on this panel will be Nicholas, CEO of CoinHouse, Kate, institutional sales at CEX.io, Laszlo, co-founder and CEO of Kiln, and Ivan, blockchain and crypto lead of BPI France, moderated by Peter, deputy dean in CED. So please, warm round of applause for the next panel. All right, good morning, everyone. 2X, we're gonna talk about how we double the amount of money um, coming from institutional into Web3, into crypto, going from about a trillion to two trillion. Um, I'll ask um, each of the panelists to kick off, tell us a little bit about how their, their company themselves have contributed to the first trillion. And if you already wanna say something about a sort of a top opportunity or challenge in the institutional space, you're welcome as well. Nicholas, CEO, CoinHouse, um, how have you guys contributed? Well, he whoa, <laughs> hello everyone. People told us that we have to speak loudly, so. Uh, um, well, CEO of CoinHouse, uh, we are a crypto broker uh, in France, uh, well established uh, since 2007. We have contributed with uh, several billions of euro um, that has been came through our platform, so people have invested this money. Uh, some of them have been becoming very rich. Uh, some are waiting for the next uh, uh, bull market, and, uh, and that's a way yes, to contribute. We have um, both um, retail and uh, corporate investors, mostly SMBs, uh, which is something very, uh, very probably unique uh, in, the, in the positioning. We know quite well how to work with them. Uh, and yeah, we bring a lot of solutions to them, uh, especially not only mm. the possibility to buy and sell crypto, but on also the possibility to access to asset management product, staking, um, a lot of solution to, uh, to manage uh, their money uh, with professionals. Right. Super to SMB, so we'll definitely want to unpack what are the different segments in institutional. But first, uh, Kate, institutional sales at CEX. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm head in sales at um, um, 10 years old crypto exchange, which previously has been mining bitcoins. And uh, we've mined around 3% of all the circulating bitcoins in the world. So I would say it's a very direct contribution to the trillion in uh, the crypto industry. Um, and um, as the future opportunities, um, particularly as a futurist at Kate Ghost Tech, I see uh, the um, interaction and interoperability between blockchain and all the other uh, forefront technologies, uh, specifically AI, quantum, and IoT. So uh, I think we should definitely be focusing on uh, building these future industries together. Thank you very much. Very good. Laszlo, uh, CEO at Kiln. Hi, guys. Can you hear me well? <clears throat> Amazing. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm, I'm Laszlo Zabo, <clears throat> the, the CEO and, and co-founder at Kiln. And Kiln, we are the leader of staking, liquid staking in Europe. So we basically spread um, transparent and secure yield in the crypto markets. Uh, we have over $2 billion of uh, uh, asset under stake or asset under management, if you will. And yeah, I mean, our mission is really to spread um, transparent and secure yield, you know, to, um, to a billion users. So not right now, we have a million customer working with exchanges, custodians, wallets, uh, but I'm pretty sure tomorrow, like billion users will, will, will use staking, liquid staking and DeFi. So yeah, that, that's kind of uh, what we do. We'll dig Ivan. into that as well. Okay, um, Ivan, uh, uh, crypto lead at BPI France, a pillar of the tech scene here, here in the country. So BPI France is kind of the French sovereign fund. Uh, we have uh, 80 million indirect exposure. We give grants, loans to crypto companies, including Kiln and Coinhouse. Mostly in France, we are investors in six companies, including Ledger, and we are also investors in seven crypto VCs. Uh, 80 million is kind of a cash for Europe, 
it's nothing compared to the 7.5 billions of A16Z, but working on it. And we also bought uh, 50,000 euro of tokens on the open market. Lot of work <laughs> well for the great transaction. Um, but we're on the way and people are willing to learn and get more exposure and it's uh, <coughs> steps, it's baby steps, but it's very important steps. Well, anyway, we'll definitely be listening for you because you're really at the coal face. How do you get big institutions to move in this space? But maybe let's, let's click off with um, a first question about what are the big growth opportunities? Um, Laszlo, you brought up staking, so um, do you want to elaborate on, on how you see key growth opportunities? Yeah, I mean, and by the way, coming back on your question about challenges, um, I oh. think um, regulation, and we'll, we'll come back to it oh. for sure, and securities we are... We cannot avoid that, so yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, go yeah. there. <laughs> and, and it may be onboarding. So, you know, I mean, are you familiar with staking at all, or the, the one that knows staking, raise the hand? Who stakes? Who right. stakes? Right, let's, let's Ethereum? <laughs> staking? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, staking is, is the first and primary yield in crypto, right? Um, you get rewarded by bonding, uh, by putting in collateral your um, ETH, your Solana, the major proof of stake protocol tokens. And uh, in return, you get the yield coming from the inflation of the protocol and, uh, and, the, and the network fees. So um, we, we've seen kind of like centralized lending collapsing in this immature market um, the past months because of FTX and, and really staking is the, um, um, the government bond, if you will, of, of crypto, the, the primary uh, source of yield. So of course, we've seen a massive amount of growth in e-staking since Chapella, right? So e's being becoming like the 50% the, the of the market in staking. And, um, and now you can withdraw your ETH, right? Before you, 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 you were locked for um, a number of time um, for a year and a half, uh, kind of, since um, ETH launched their, their staking operation. So it means that um, now, yeah, you can go in and out um, in a much um, easier and f secure way, in a way. So it's like we, we've seen just a, um, a tremendous amount of ETH that has been taken the past months. And ETH staking is about 15%. Um, of all ETH uh, that are staked, and, and we think it's going to be about like 60 to 65 to 70 percent of all ETH that, that will right. be staked in the future. Super so, uh, yeah, tremendous amount of growth coming. Uh, Nicholas, maybe you next on where you see growth. Well, um, asset management clearly uh, in the well. Also, uh, the staking and is part of it. So uh, we work with people like Kiel and other uh, to bring. Uh, in fact, we just uh, started again to offer some uh, some product uh, yield product on the platform. Uh, it's starting few uh, few days ago, and we already have uh, um, very impressive amount. It's it's uh, in fact we've reached in four days what we were expecting to get uh, mid July. Uh, okay. In terms of uh, amount the of money, what's between retail and institutional? It's in terms of revenue, it's fifty percent mm -hmm. uh, institutional and fifty percent uh, uh, institutional uh, and corporate, and fifty percent uh, retail. On the retail side, we've got um, two thirds are premium customer, uh, meaning people that invest much more money than uh, uh, what the people usually do uh, in uh, in crypto. We have a, a kind of premium model in that way. Uh, that's on the revenue side. On, on, the, on the customer side, for sure, you've got a Pareto, which means that you have much more retail people uh, by number than, uh, than in, by, by volume. And, and people are definitely, uh, uh, especially during this period, uh, interesting in um, either doing uh, DCL, so dollar cost average investment, so you, you invest regularly rather than putting your money in one shot. Uh, or you, um, you, um, you basically hold and stake, uh, get some return, uh, start working also with our, our asset management products. So we manage your money on, on behalf of yourself and, uh, and we have interesting return on, on those products. So I see the evolution uh, coming from, from this part on our side. And in general, in the market, uh, yeah, uh, we've got more and more institutional uh, coming, uh, but then it's a question of which institutional are we talking about? I think it's one of your questions. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kate, maybe you next. Uh, again, anything on growth opportunities, but I'm also curious what you brought up about interaction with other technologies and whether that's already a growth opportunity. Uh, well, um, I think in 2017, the CEO of JP Morgan openly called crypt crypto a fraud. 
uh, while currently JP Morgan is at the forefront of crypto adoption and uh, doing various um, blockchain uh, innovations and uh, launching their own token. Does that mean that crypto won? Does this mean that we actually all already overcame this barrier and it's a white crypto adoption? Not at all. Whatever they're doing is still a drop in the ocean. It's like we are talking currently about, about, about a trillion while the traditional economy is tens, hundreds of trillions. So crypto is nowhere near gold, cash, or real estate. Why? Well, pr probably we have to go back to our most favorite topic here, uh, which is regulation. Uh, when we're talking about regulation and some politicians doing nasty stuff we don't like, it's not because they're stupid or ill-informed or not educated enough. It's not in their interest to bring more regulation because it would mean that their sources of income, uh, their established patterns of operation would be disrupted. So um, I think we need to be talking more about the lobbying, geopolitical and interaction with the uh, top decision All right. makers. All right, let's go there. I mean, clearly, who's got the most to learn, lose from the disruption of the current financial system? Probably the US, right? And so you can interpret some actions in that light, perhaps. Um, okay, so why don't we, we dig into the regulatory stuff and not avoid it? Um, maybe put it a little broader. Where do you think about geography? So where, how is Europe positioned? How, how are different, you know, different countries are, and jurisdictions are taking uh, different approaches? All right, you're, yeah. you're willing to start. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Well, <laughs> it's because well, I'm, uh, I'm regulated as, uh, as, uh, as Kate are, but um, uh, well, I think France and, and Europe is m m probably m m much more advanced and we uh, see now the debate in the US around uh, the SAC and, uh, and the qualification of some tokens as security. Um, they are still trying to define themselves what is crypto in fact and, and uh, I think the, uh, they are in the wrong direction and uh, they are not taking the subject by the, uh, by the proper way to, uh, to, to manage it, which is strange enough. Uh, because usually they are much more uh, pragmatic and, and business friendly than we are in Europe. Uh, in Europe, we have established a regulation which is so are far. Are you going to say Mika is business friendly? Is that the. Well, yes, and yes or no, because Mika is a sense of accelerating the business in some way. I mean, we are dealing with crypto every day, we have billions of money going around. You cannot manage this money without a regulation. I mean, at some point, we have to be serious about it. So um, you start with nothing, uh, and you see what happened, and some great company over the world have succeeded, making a lot, a lot, a lot of money by doing uh, creepy things regarding uh, uh, regulation, KYC, and everything, which means nothing. Uh, so that's good. They make a lot of money. Great. Now they're probably going to pay a little bit, and maybe some of them will be with shake. But um, uh, on the side of Europe, I mean, the, the regulation in France started uh, three years ago. We were the first one regulated, March 2020. And the regulation is not blocking us. We have banks, we work with Societe Generale, with other banks. Uh, we have been able to make businesses and so on. So um, if it's, it's working. Uh, and MICA is just the next step. And, and what was good is to say that you first start with a regulation mostly looking on AML and CFT. Uh, which is only anti-money laundering and, and fight against terrorism and, and, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, white um, uh, blanchiment d'argent, sorry. Um, anyway, that's the first step. Now, uh, you need necessarily, when you, uh, when you deal with, uh, with customers, to have a, uh, a proper communication, customer success. You need to, to, to get funds as well. Uh, we have seen that with uh, what happened last uh, year with FTX, Genesis, and some other guys. Uh, they were claiming the balance sheet that one, but what was the reality behind? So we need also, even for us, to get to work with people that uh, are sustainable, uh, that also are able to show reality uh, about what they are doing and, and not uh, just hiding some stuff. So I believe in, in some point, yeah. when it's gradua graduated, uh, it works. Mika is in two years from now. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. But, but clearly the industry is at a point 
where some regulation is better than none and certainly better than the uncertainty of who knows what could come. Um, well, uh, Ivan over at BPI France, what's, what's your perspective on uh, how, how Europe is doing within the global regulatory context? Uh, yes, Europe did a tremendous job um, and that's great, but there is a question about is it a real first mover advantage? Uh, Middle East is very well positioned right now. IDGM is doing also a tremendous job and they have a little more money than us right now. Um, and uh, Stop I Stop filling up your car. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you can and still give money to the BPI at the end of the talk. Uh, yes, we will invest this, it wisely. And um, no, more seriously, US is very interesting because yes, uh, you have a sheriff shooting in the air every morning, but they did something. Uh, Franklin Templeton did an application called Benji and you can, you have a bridge, uh, a bridge between crypto liquidity and tokenized money market funds and everybody's happy because if you buy money market funds then you buy dollar and everything's on chain and everything's winning. So this, this is a sign where US are not dumb, they know what they're doing. If the dollar is winning, they would go for crypto for sure. But if, if the dollar is losing, then it might be another story. Yeah. Uh, um, Laszlo and Kate, you want to get in a little more on, on regulation? Also, I'm curious if anyone's active in Hong Kong and, and can elucidate what's happening out there. Yeah, I mean, we, we have clients everywhere in the world. Um, you know, I would divide like, you know, the US, uh, EMEA, Middle East, APAC, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, as you mentioned, right? Mm. Um, I mean, I think the most massive growth in, in at least B2B crypto in, in, in the coming months and years will come and will be linked to a, a business friendly regulators. Um, it's the case um, in APAC, like Singapore has been you know, very friendly for years and now Hong Kong is coming back um, for many reasons. Uh, but obviously, you know, they, they, they kind of uh, missed a few years um, pushing away people in Singapore and now you know, the, um, the Chinese government seems to be uh, to be willing to, to get crypto companies back in Hong Kong. Middle Competition East, is an interesting thing even at the regulatory uh, level, right? Exactly, exactly, mm -hmm. right. Uh, Middle East, obviously, it's now a, a big hub um, in the middle of the dessert. Um, and then, obviously, you know, EMEA, Mika, at least at the end of the day, we have, we have clarity, we have regulation. The problem in the U.S. right now, and that's really a specificity that you have in the U.S., it's you have two regulators, right? You have the SEC. At least. At least, yeah, 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 yeah of course. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe three, maybe four with you and five with me, I don't know. It's like there's many people that giving uh, opinion right now. So, of course, you have the SEC, the Security, Ex e Security Exchange Commission, and then you have uh, the CFTC on commodities. And even this debate of separating crypto between commodities and securities is a bit weird. And obviously saying that Ethereum, Solana, all the major, let's say, proof of stake protocol, right? Because, because that's my topic, are not common goods, but they are like Apple or Tesla. They are companies um, that have, you know, a board and, you know, a, a, a responsible if, if the price goes down, it's, it's, it's just a shortcut. So at some point, and basically all the regulators are doing well, they're taking crypto as a new asset. Um, as a decentralized asset um, that is, are different from bonds and different for, from equity. And, and obviously, um, you have more clarity for, for companies to, to build um, in, uh, in this jurisdiction. And, and, and just maybe one last thing, uh, Kate, before, before you jump on. You know, Mika in France is doing well, you know? AMF is doing well. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from the AMF here. We have someone from the, the BPI on, on stage. But, like, I'm proud to be in Paris right now, I have to say. Very nice. Kate? I'm also very proud to be in Paris. I'm probably more happy than proud. Um, uh, I've been working in, at um, US Congress about 10 years ago and have written some articles uh, actually claiming, thinking that uh, maybe Satoshi Nakamoto was uh, the FAD or the CIA. Because if you think about it, it's actually ridiculously strange that US hasn't clamped down on crypto before since, since dollar is the world's reserve currency. And 
Bitcoin is literally was literally created to substitute dollars. If you think about it, and overall, America's aggressive behavior towards uh, defending its economic interest, it's, it's really strange. However, what's happening now shows that either something changed or, uh, or maybe it's, it's, it's a part of the long play with crypto. Uh, but back to your question about Hong Kong, I've been there uh, two months ago and it's, you can clearly see that Hong Kong is becoming the uh, Chinese back door into the uh, crypto world. So um, going back to US, probably the fact that US started clamping down on crypto is also related to Chinese um, lack of desire to, to, to dig and figure out their relationship with this asset because they banned it, what, 2013 and later the, the mining as well. So if suddenly China goes back to crypto and decides that they want to be the world leader in this technology and blockchain, well then US will suddenly yeah, yeah. be very concerned. <laughs> Ge geopolitics just makes tech even more complicated. Uh, again, the other part of the U.S. is, again, their legislative process is largely broken, so their ability to pass new regulation is seems like almost zip, which makes it hard for them to actually be very strategic in the space. It's really opening up a huge opportunity for other jurisdictions. Um, I want to come bring us back, though, to, to this main topic of, of institutional dig a little bit deeper there. Um, we, we can keep bringing in some of the, the geographic stuff, though. Maybe, Nicholas, just, just in your experience, what are the different segments? That, how do we define institutional? What are the segments? And then we can sort of maybe think about, for those active in the space, where are the real opportunities um, in this? How do we unpack institutional? Well, first of all, when you think about institutional, you think about the last asset manager from the world. Uh, and as Kate said, there was, uh, the there are almost no one right now in the, in the market. Even if uh, we see 1 billion, 10 billion coming in the crypto business, it's still, like you say, a drop. And you're, you're perfectly right. The, the size of the financial market overall is so huge that the crypto market is still very, very far from, from being institutional. Even if you think about Grayscale and the money that came for uh, their, um, their funds and so on, it's, it's still very, uh, very, uh, very small and, and, and unmature. So um, you have unfortunately huge right growth opportunity, but huge growth opportunity. But right now you, have, you the, have to uh, on the positive side, which will be at the end the uh, the next uh, the next move because there are some some good signs that things are moving, but. The large one you have to skip right now from the from the crypto space, and then after you've got the crypto funds, uh, because there are hedge funds and, and, and people that are specialized um, companies. Uh, we have companies like like us because we work as an institutional when we work with uh, Kill or, or the other. Uh, if you've got Coinbase. Prime is, uh, is an institutional solution. So every company has an institutional working also with uh, um, family offices, um, uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, dedicated funds, but it's still very, uh, very, uh, very new right now uh, compared to the large opportunity. Um, yeah, if you... Uh, anyway, other people want to... Ivan, what's your sort of perspective on the landscape and in institutional? Um, yes, what's really interesting is that there, there is... Um, many approaches of this asset class. You can be a hedge fund, uh, you can be a crypto VC and do token warrants, uh, you can be a, a crypto asset manager, you can do liquid staking, and it will be interesting to see who will be the winners of this kind of uh, you know, evolution of the market. And it's very hard to know right now. Uh, everybody thought that um, liquid uh, strategies were amazing, but now most of the shops are closing uh, and, and on market neutral and arbitrage. It, it, it's not as good as, as before. And, and it will be super interesting to see who will be the clear winners. Crypto VCs are very well positioned, but some people say that A16Z is owning kind of 4% of the crypto space globally with all in investment. So it, it might be very risky. So uh, happy to see also where the TradFi will come and how will they contribute and how will they take value? 
I'm still interested in this question, but also if we can start thinking about what are, what are these different players looking for when they think about whether or not to do crypto, especially some of the more traditional players that sit on all this money. But Kate. Yeah, that, that's exactly why I wanted to address your second part even more, which yeah. feature is. Uh -huh. um, so I think broadly, um, institutional players could be divided into two categories for the ease of understanding. Uh, the risk takers ones, the, which are crypto funds, VCs, hedge funds, who are more than happy to uh, dibble with cryptos, figure out how to increase ROI and how to make um, um, outsized returns. And the other part would be the wealth preservers, which are tasks, uh, tasked with a huge responsibility of especially preserving the wealth of the nations or big families. And of course, it would be very reckless for them to go into the industry with very low still regulation where the money they invest can be suddenly hacked or suddenly stolen and there isn't really very clear regulation or accountability of how to go after the perpetrators of this. So I think we are going to be um, staying in the drop of the ocean category for as long as we can't penetrate the wealth preservers market of institutional investors. Uh, one, to, to what extent are people using recent events, the current pause, to put the foundations in place so that over time you, you will build the confidence. Do you, do you feel, is the industry doing what it needs to do to, to get ready for a next uptake? I, yeah. I mean, just coming back on, on the institutional question, uh, just yeah. to say a few words, like... It was a good e question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and obviously, you know, coming back, I mean, obviously, like, foundations are, are will, will bring more institution in the space. So we work with pure players today bottom of the stack, exchanges, wallets, custodian. And on top, obviously, you have crypto funds, hedge funds, market makers. But as you mentioned, they are usually crypto players, pure players, because the um, tried by companies that have the most of AUM, the, the, the you know, 100 trillions that we were talking about, uh, they are still waiting for more clarity uh, in terms of regulation, right? So there's no license in the world today on staking or DeFi. Um, and it will come, but it, these players won't come in the crypto market before there's more clarity. That's first. Second is like, what's institutional for us in staking, you need to have insurance. You need to have uh, SLAs uh, because you have still a risk. You, you're providing a yield, uh, but you, you still have the risk of slashing. You, you need to have a, have a reputation, um, right? It's, you, 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 we, we, we work with CoinHouse and, and, and reputation is about everything, right? It's like you, overnight um, you get act or you get slashed or you get um, stolen or uh, you know you, you have um, um, a problem on, on the yield you're offering. Of course, you, you, you're damaging the, the ecosystem as a whole, but obviously your brand. So um, what was the, 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 the previous question? Was like the uh, so, foundation? So are, yeah, are, are, is the industry you know, making the changes? Are they on the path? Um, to, to, to really create something that ultimately the wealth custodians could embrace? Well, ju just to, to complement what uh, Laszlo said, there is, a <coughs> there is a need for, uh, at least for the first part of what we defined uh, as the crypto players right now, H and, and the current uh, uh, exchanges, broker, custodian, and so on, for uh, more also transparency, and uh, the regulation on one side is something, but it's, it's, it's for us, it's more like um, the ability to work uh, in a better way, uh, to work legally also uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with binding terms and, and, and stuff that uh, were not necessarily uh, the way of thinking before. You, you were working with funds without uh, necessarily um, the, uh, what you are used to get in the traditional financial uh, industry. And that's why now even in this uh, uh, ecosystem, there are some blockers. And the market is, um, 
is still suffering from FTX and, and, and from uh, all what happened last year uh, and what maybe will happen also uh, because it's probably not finished. Uh, you, uh, uh, so we still need also to, to work in a better way and to clarify. We, we have really seen things changing between us and our counterparty and the discussion that we have with, with them are now totally different. Uh, so um, they are much more eager to, um, to share about everything that they had uh, to, uh, to sign contracts which are much more uh, binding. And so we see that if they don't do it, we won't work. So um, at least for this ecosystem, this is mandatory. For the rest of the ecosystem, which is not crypto yet, probably the regulation and the fact that the first ecosystem works and grow will let them entering the, 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 um, yeah, the, the crypto world. So, so Ivan, may I put you on the spot? You sit inside what's actually a pretty traditional uh, organization, that, and, and yet you lead on crypto. Um, how you want to just share a little bit about how it is to to move a, a traditional organization? Uh, the luck we have is that we have a mandate to finance innovation, so we can do grants, loans, equity financing, fund financing. Then there is the internal side, which is more complicated, but. You have to practice what you preach. <laughs> um, and the real thing is that you have to leverage on technology. This is the key. I mean, everybody could do flashbots. Everybody knew about front running. But it's hard, <laughs> and you have to be good at it. And if you're waiting for the very vanilla product, then your yield would be very poor. Mm. So I think banks shouldn't understand that uh, this risk-reward couple mm. is, is a, a very good uh, way of, of analyzing this market. And there are still tremendous opportunities. And I think these opportunities mm. will, will go and, and not vanish, but be less interesting. So I would encourage traditional finance to go now, mm. like Société Générale did, uh, with the derivatives market in the 90s, and that was a huge success. Mm -hmm. And I agree. Uh, yeah. Use flashbots. Um, you know, it will, will get you better yields. <laughs> Very nice. Um, just uh, we still have a little bit of time. Um, what do you guys see from from the institutional investor side? The sort of mix of decentralization versus centralization as we think about how to create a, a strong ecosystem. Um, Clearly, the, a lot of the original excitement was around de decentralization. The reality proves a lot more complicated. Um, anyone have a, a view on, on what I mean, institutions really going to be drawn in by, by pure DeFi? I mean, I think if, w what crypto brings first is mm. trust and transparency, mm. right? Then decentralization is, is a third, like, um, big word, but it's a, it's a spectrum. It's like, yeah. is DAO today, Lido, Aave, and other in DeFi decentralized? You know, that's yeah. a big question. But at least you, you know where the money goes, you know the money mm. flows, and, and, and that's really different from tra traditional finance. We've seen that with um, Silicon Valley Bank, right? It was mm. where everything was opaque and would crash the bank. So um, I think institution in the space, they understand this concept of decentralization. For example, in staking, like, E, that's exactly what we're building. We're building aggregators so that they can use different staking providers. We run validators ourselves, but they will run mm. uh, validators for themselves or use different providers to spread the risk to keep the network decentralized. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's quite quite special to crypto. Everything is not decentralized today, but um, I'm still very bullish about mm. you know um, the future. And, and, but, and but but for you, you'd say like the key selling proposition going forward would be more on amazing transparency that you can deliver, and less on some of the earlier stuff. Yeah, Kate. Um, I think the mistake we make when talking about centralization versus decentralization is. Um, looking narrowly into its application to financial sector and crypto specifically. Uh, while I think generally decentralization should be thought more in the domain of not just Web3, but basically the, the change of the whole way of how the world operates. And if we're talking about the wider adoption of cryptocurrencies, it's worth looking back 
to basics and seeing how cryptocurrencies were created in the first place. And they were created, Bitcoin, uh, in conjunction with uh, blockchain, the ledger. Um, and I think instead of creating new tokens, new DAOs and NFTs, in fact, we should go back to the very beginning and the very point and reason of why these cryptocurrencies have been created in the first place. So until we have blockchain as a technology adopted in every sphere of our lives, which is record keeping government um, details, data being kept on blockchain, our passport data, our um, internet searches, while it's not integrated with AI, until blockchain is in every single domain of our interaction, crypto is going to stay just a speculative asset and not an actual world-changing technology. Um, okay, one thing that hasn't come up, I'm mindful of time, but we haven't talked too much about the basic technology operational effects. Is that because it's less important, that part's more in place? What, where, where do we stand? Again from the needs of institutional players in, in terms of the, the underlying technology foundations? Uh, yeah. we, we have a big IT department. <laughs> we have no uh, crypto developers for now. The good news is that many guys in the IT department <laughs> want to contribute and are like checking you at the coffee machine like, hey, hey. I want to talk <laughs> about crypto. And, and I think that's a, the that's a first great opportunity. And I agree with Kate, the other great opportunity is that when you go at the Political Science Institute at Sciences Po, students are talking about decentralization. And I think that at, at INSEAD too, and this is great. And I think the, the good balance between the two worlds might bring a next version, and I'm very excited. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, I'm mindful of time. We're gonna gonna start wrapping up. So I just invite all of you to offer sort of final thoughts. What maybe makes you optimistic about um, uh, the future in institutional? Um, maybe a bit of a prediction. When when will the market turn up or whatever you want to do with it? Um, we'll go this way. Nicholas, first up. Okay. So yes, optimistic uh, because if you work in crypto, you have to be optimistic anyway. Uh, so, but yeah, really optimistic because uh, we talk about institutional not going into crypto now. But in fact, when you grab a little bit and you go into the details, uh, you see people moving. Uh, there are right now uh, several European banks that are uh, have put in place teams. You mentioned it, uh, and not only sovereign funds and, and uh, people like uh, wh what Ivan was talking about uh, BPI, but also real banks that want to offer crypto to their customer. And I'm talking about retail banks, not about uh, any uh, neo banks, uh, um, which um, is, um, is from uh, anywhere in Europe. I mean, so they are thinking, they are developing teams. Um, they are not even considering now that uh, Bitcoin is... Uh, is, uh, is crime or is, uh, is, is it just uh, uh, money laundering. Um, they, they reconsider that uh, this is an asset. Uh, they probably understood what you said also about decentralization and so on. And they know that at the, now, now they understand that if they don't move, probably they will be killed. Not now, but over 5, 10, 15 years, they might disappear. Uh, institution, we, we talk about banks, but Visa or MasterCard as well, Stripe, Adyen, all those guys that are processing um, uh, payments. Uh, in fact, when you go from a wallet to wallet, you don't go from a bank to bank, you don't have orchestration, you don't have any of the stuff. Uh, and it's fast. Uh, to, just to, to, to make, we, we did something like a transfer of 1.6 million a few days ago from a wallet to a wallet in if It cost us something like 0 0.21 euros. Uh, and it was very fast. Um, how long does it take and how much does it cost to go from a, a European bank to something in Brazil or in Hong Kong? So you now is understand. They know. Um, they equip themselves. Um, they start with custodian solution. Uh, people like Ledger, Fireblocks, Copper, BitGo, all those guys. Uh, and this is also what the guys are talking about us. You've got people also um, in, in many places in Europe developing this. So it's going to happen. 
this year, no, but probably 2024, 2025. We want a date. You will, you will uh, see. Yeah. Which, which quarter, 24? No, just <laughs> uh, Kate, you're up. <laughs> Uh, back when I was uh, lobbying uh, the lifting of Cuban embargo legislation in Congress, I was usually told to, to get lost by most congressmen uh, on the Hill uh, because back then it was quite an out outrageous proposal and Cuba was uh, the, the, the big enemy of America. If you think about it, crypto overall is such similarly outrageous concept to the whole financial system as lifting Cuban embargo was 10 years ago. However, when you are raising the subject of investing into crypto or adopting blockchain, no financial institution today will dismiss you fully. They will potentially say that they're not ready yet. They might say that they're looking into it or they might say it's not maybe in their risk profile just yet, but they will consider it. And for the technology that's been around less than two decades, it's actually quite, quite impressive. Today, we can, we can have a crypto conference and crypto party and after party in any single point in the world if we wanted to go to a crypto gathering every single day. It's not even the same for technologies uh, that are equally groundbreaking, like AI or quantum or different IoT chemical components. So for as long as crypto's been around, the progress we've made is outstanding. Yeah, yeah. Like the first downturn where people aren't talking about crypto actually going away, right? It's just a regular downturn. Um, Laszlo, closing thoughts. Yeah, I mean, if, if the question is like, am I bullish um, in crypto and the crypto market these days? Of course, right? It's like we have lived um, three bear markets. This one is actually the, the, the best bear market I've lived, right? It's like the, the, the prices are not going fully and completely apart. And, and, and the amount of companies building in the space are just insane. It's like there's so many innovation happening right now and you were talking about AI. Obviously, AI is a groundbreaking technology, but I really think the most innovative, the fastest growing, the, the number of intelligent teams working together to advance this unique technology compared to any other technology. You know, crypto is, is, is amazing in that way, right? It's, there's a lot of innovation happening. Then if you look at institutions, you were mentioning Société Générale with Fidelity, Société Générale, Goldman Sachs. I can tell you that these guys are preparing for the coming years. Of course, they're not flowing a lot of assets into crypto now because of regulation, we mention it, but still it's coming. And last but not least, good, uh, the bull market, I think is, uh, no, I'm not gonna give you your like uh, uh, Okay, <laughs> Ivan. Next year, next year. Please, which uh, quarter? <laughs> Ivan. Very quickly, uh, very bullish on uh, ZK proofs. Uh, because it's very compatible with uh, European Commission vision about <laughs> AI. Uh, okay, we have questions, it's working, but that, does that scale and is there a real business model, but very bullish on this. And of course, as you mentioned, when you have the best talents and VC money, you are in the best position. All right, thank you. Cool Nicholas and Kate, um, Laszlo, Ivan, Thank you very much for your insights. Big round of applause for our panelists, please. Thanks to you. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of the time.